Ah, good morning, everyone. It's a uh, rather chilly morning here in Santa Barbara. It's very windy today, so you may hear that. When I uh, designed, decided to build this little building, I didn't want it insulated because I wanted to be able to hear the outside and feel the outside, even when the windows are closed like they are now, which is great, but I can feel and hear the outside, and you may hear it during this, so sorry about that. So... You know, when I came up with the title for this course, I kind of went back and forth for a while. So initially, uh, I was definitely sure I wanted to call it the climate crisis and definitely sure I wanted the first part to be what it is, but I didn't know how to end it. So it was either going to be the climate crisis, what it is and what we can do about it or what each of us can do about it. I ultimately decided on the latter because I, I wanted to to let people know that they can can do things, let you know that you can do things, you can do things individually. And we just saw that with Project Drawdown with the, you know, the top three things that, that you could do that um, can involve personal action. But it's also clear, uh, hopefully now, that we can't do this individually. We have to do this alone. This is a challenge that humanity is facing together regarding the entire globe. It's not like some of the environmental challenges that we had a generation or two ago where it was specific problems like a, a factory is emitting pollution. You can focus right on that factory. We call that point source pollution. You can focus on the source of it, find the you know, pinpoint it and focus on it. This is everywhere. It's involving all of humanity. So we can't even just focus on it nationally. We have to, to do so, you know, internationally, really as a species occupying uh, this planet. Anyhow, with, with that in mind, you know, we've looked at things like uh, what we could do with legislation regarding um, the kind of refrigerants we use. That, that would be a pretty simple thing to do if we just get our act together on it, which we are. But what if you wanted to do the whole thing? What if you wanted to put a plan together that would address the issue, a big plan that addresses the social problems, the actual issues it's themselves? You know, what would that be like? Well, we have it. It's the Green New Deal. And, well, first off, it is the most comprehensive climate legislation ever proposed in the United States by a long shot. And it also sort of addresses a, a question, and that is, you know, even if you want it change, throughout the last, so, 50 years or so of my life, and from, I'm from a teenager on when I've seen it, seen things unfolding, there weren't necessarily politicians, at least not viable politicians, that you could elect, say, on a national level. There were some, you know, um, Jimmy Carter would be an example when I was a teenager that, you know, put solar panels on the White House and all. And he I definitely, I think in many ways, his heart was in the right place environmentally. But that's not to say that Jimmy Carter had, you know, a complete plan on how to do this. Flash forward to the turn of the century where Al Gore was running for president. And, you know, Gore, obviously a committed environmentalist with a focus on climate. And in fact, you know, he won the um, one or shared in a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for his work on climate. But, but Gore didn't really have a plan in place when um, and certainly wasn't what he um, his you know platform that he ran on. Flash forward again to 2016 or so, and really for the first time we had candidates who were comprehensively thinking about this issue, and Bernie Sanders would be the example. And Sanders, you know, didn't fully have it formed, but move forward again to 2018 to the midterm elections when a young campaign worker who had been working on the Bernie Sanders campaign and when Sanders did not get elected president could have just been crestfallen and forgotten about the whole thing. But instead, she ran for um, Congress and there's a museum in, at least there was, but it's part of an exhibit in New York, who had AOC's shoes on display. And what that's all about is um, she went door to door 
asking people to vote for her um, in her precincts, the Bronx, and um, in the process wore holes in her shoes. And um, it, I don't, you know, it seems to me like as good as any, and in fact, a wonderful um, example of, you know, what determination can do. And and it really is astonishing what, what she was able to do, because we'll talk about AOC as we get into this deep dive, but what she did was to put to get, you know, she didn't put the Green New Deal uh, um, legislation that we've seen together all by herself, and it certainly did exist before her in different forms from different groups. But AOC really is responsible, I think, and became not, sort of the person most associated with spearheading this propose, uh, proposal and, um, and has taken the most heat for it. But the important point is, if you want change, if we want change, there are now politicians waiting in the wings, waiting to be elected, who are willing to do that change. And actually, in the case of like, you know, Bernie Sanders and all, a viable presidential candidate um, who, you know, has, you know, is putting climate at the very forefront and, and all the other issues, which we're going to talk about in a moment, that are related to it that we need to think about, things like social justice issues and healthcare and, and all that. So it's it's an intriguing moment and a gratifying moment I think in history because people are thinking about how what to do here, how to comprehensively deal with this. And we'll look at this this thought on it, the Green New Deal. And then, you know, they are viable politicians. I don't know how else to put it. They're actually people that you can vote for that that are going to foreground this. And I think, yes, Bernie Sanders did not receive the, um, you know, is not our president today. Okay. But it doesn't, and, and the Green New Deal is not the Biden climate plan. Um, although one of the uh, important things to note about the Green New Deal, even though it didn't get implemented, even though Bernie Sanders didn't get you know elected president and we're not implementing it right now, um, it influenced a great deal. It influenced a great deal of the Biden climate plan. It's, 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 the Biden climate plan, again, is not the Green New Deal, but you can see the Green New Deal written all over it in different ways. But it doesn't go quite, it doesn't go as far and unfortunately in sort of the social justice ways but we'll talk about that but anyhow let's um let's jump right into the first comment um yeah i think this says it all uh, I was one of the people misled, misinformed about the Green New Deal due to the media's portrayal of it. All I knew was that it was about climate change and that it was radical. I think that's what most Americans know about the Green New Deal. It's vaguely about climate change and that it's radical. When I say that, I mean people on sort of both sides of the political divide. So certainly <clears throat> a certain kind of media like Fox News is represented as being really radical and many politicians, including, you know, I quoted from um, Donald uh, Trump's uh, former Twitter account, um, you know, certainly argued that it was. But But people who, you know, are... On the other side, people who are more liberal, but, you know, see it that way, too, sometimes. In other words, you know, see it as, well, yeah, it's, it's a good idea, but it's this really radical thing, or it's really a radical thing. So even sort of moderate, you know, Democrats might have trouble getting, going on, getting on board for it. But this person who rightly notes here, this is because, and this is what we focused in on here, the media's portrayal of it. So again, it's one of these fascinating issue, issues, right, that you think, well, this is just a political issue, um, you know, in the same way we would think something's just a scientific issue. But the com way it's communicated, the portrayal of it, and that's why, you know, this course, which is about, you know, reading, uh, basically, how this is portrayed is absolutely huge. And it has been successfully misportrayed to the American public so that most people just aren't even aware of it. Which is why I, I, you know, did the logical thing and, and gave it to you to read because, you know, it takes 15 minutes to read. And, you know, you now know what is actually in it, which is just so, you know, essential here. Okay, so let's jump back and scroll down. 
Yeah. Um, seemed confusing, but this person writing notes, two major parts. What we need to do to solve the climate crisis and how the American people will be protected. Looked at like this, it may, uh, makes it seem much more simple and doable. Yeah, so let me repeat that. What we need to do to solve the climate crisis and how the American people will be protected. Yeah, um, wonderfully succinct way of, of looking at this document. It is just that two things, you know, it's about, you know, solving the climate crisis, what we can do to do it, but how the American people will be protected. And that is absolutely central to this document, but also opens it up for a range of attacks. What I mean by that. So we are, we are embarking on something here that's, that's, Big, really big, is as big as we've ever done. What I mean by that is, you know, since the growth of technological modernity, the so-called industrial revolution, two or three hundred years ago, you know, that has meant that our economy has been built on fossil fuels. We call it the fossil fuel economy. We're shifting to a new type of economy. That means everything you know, everything, many, many things are going to shift around. And we saw sort of almost like, you know, an early shot across the bow, what that's going to be like with the coal industry. And again, I've noted how, you know, the coal industry obviously came, you know, be came to be behind Donald Trump and deeply in support of him because Trump said, don't worry, I will not touch that industry. The problem is we need to touch that industry. That that's, one of the biggest, I mean, that's, it's not one of the biggest, but it's, 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 a, it's, it's becomes, it's, it's a wonderful, like, example of the problem because coal is one of the biggest, dirtiest problems. But it's not going to be the first industry like that. There are many that are going to be disrupted, you know, and whether they shift or not, people are, I mean, in, when they're in the process of shifting, sorry, um, people are going to get hurt. It's the coal industry. People are going to lose their jobs. We have to do away with mining coal. It just doesn't make any sense in the 21st century. We have better, um, you know, forms of energy and the forms of renewables that you know, actually are cheaper now. And furthermore, they're obviously far, far better for the planet. But what about all those people? And those people were rightly very concerned about their future. And they, of course, supported someone like Donald Trump, who was reactionary. He said, I'm not going to change anything. Don't worry. In fact, I want to turn the clock back and make America like it was, you know, make America great again and all. But we have to do away with that industry. We have to change things like one of the things I lectured on, you know, air travel. Air travel has to significantly change and downsize. Um, it, it, it has to. But on the other hand, there are new industries that will replace these. So with air travel, you know, high speed rail. So you know, I mentioned in one of the lectures, so that if you're going from LA to Chicago, which is a hub, or LA to Atlanta, or LA to New York, there would be high speed rail that would take you there. So you may not be able to fly to Chicago in four hours, but you could get there a high speed rail in 10, which isn't that big a deal, in my way of thinking time wise, especially since, you know, high speed rail is, uh, when powered by renewables is probably one of the most efficient ways of moving around on the planet and air travel is one of the worst. All that makes sense. But what about all the those people? What about those industries? All sorts of industries are going to be changed. And, you know, what happens then? So forget about the, the companies themselves. What happens to those people, all those people with so many jobs and all? Um, we have to make sure that they are protected. And as this person already said, I'm just reading it here, you know, how the American people will be protected. So that has to be a central part of any plan. And the Green New Deal has understood that completely. So what does that mean? Um, let me go, actually go down here and go to um, a couple other comments and we'll get to that. Um, First, let me get to this one, and then we're going to get into what that, well, actually, sorry, I'm, 
I'm scattered brain this morning. Um, what it means, and I'll just cover it in a brief way, and then I want to get to the, the New Deal thing here. It means that you have to make sure that, one, when people lose their jobs and those jobs go away, that they're protected, that they have not just, you know, unemployment benefits that last a few months, but they have guaranteed salary that they would be able to continue to receive, um, you know, uh, um, a, a wage. You also have to make sure that their other benefits don't get broken in the process, like health care, right? You work for a company and you get, you know, uh, laid off, then your health care ends. That's the way it works in the United States now. If you're fortunate enough to have a job that actually has health benefits, well, this way of thinking, everyone should have comprehensive health care in the United States. That would solve that problem. Then you have issues, well, all these folks, they're going to be need to get into new industries and all. Well, education has to be central to that one way or another. So the Green New Deal, you know, realizes that's an issue. And, you know, imagine millions of people, you know, laid off, having to transition into new jobs. They shouldn't have to pay for that education, and nor should anyone. So education, you know, in the form of college education, you know, undergraduate and graduate is, is free in the Green New Deal for everyone. Now, at this point, you might balk and say, well, how could we ever afford it? No government could ever afford that. But again, with the so-called Nordic model, countries like Denmark and all, they do just that. They, you know, they provide obviously health care for everyone. They provide education for everyone. It is absolutely possible for countries that are, you know, very similar to the United States in some regards with respect to, you know, where they are um, economically and uh, like the per capita income of individuals. It, it can absolutely be done. So, this also opens the Green New Deal up for a lot of attack, right? Because it's supposed to be about the climate, and why is it about giving people these things? So, you know, um, in the, the reactionary mode that comes to this, you know, this is all about giving people free stuff, free, you know, um, health care, free education, free this, free that. Who's going to pay for it? And people who feel that, you know, they're working hard and they pay too much money in taxes are frustrated that they're going to have to pay for this not seeing that it's the other way around, that you could actually be the beneficiary of all this too, that we all pay into this and we all benefit by it. But let me continue on with the comments because there, there are so many good points. I, I, I had a great deal of difficulty, by the way, this week trying to, to line up the comments and finding um, time for all of them. So I'm not going to talk too much. Yeah, uh, this person is right in assuming that the title is a reference to FDR's New Deal. Um, uh, mirror the circumstances uh, of that time to our present day. America is facing one of the most pressing issues, and the government needs to create sweeping change in order to, uh, in order for its people to thrive again. Similar to the New Deal, the Green New Deal aims to assume the responsibility for transitioning the American people from one stage to another. This is great because it's obviously uh, it's obvious that such a huge overtone is going to affect the lives of many, and um, well, as we all know, it will affect our country. Um, I actually cut this off here, but. Yeah, so what's the Green New Deal about, uh, reference to? It's a reference to the New Deal. What was the New Deal about? You probably know this from high school or from other classes, but in the 1930s, middle of the Great Recession, or the Great Depression, you know, the American people were, were hurting and there were people who were doing very, very well, large corporations. There was, there was nothing throttling companies back. There was no minimum wage. There was no, you know, guaranteed health care and there wouldn't be for a long time. But FDR put into um, effect this sweeping New Deal that changed all that, that took control away from corporations and gave it to the government. And then the government acted not, you know, to the benefit of corporations, but to the benefit of people. And it was a milestone because it, it set you know, the United States on a career for the next 40 years or so, where a strong government, large government provided for people. In the last, in the most recent 40 years, that has been kind of systematically dismantled under the free market sort of mantra that we have today. 
But that's what the green, what the original New Deal was about. So the Green New Deal is looking back on that, and it's suggesting that we need a stronger government that will take care of people and it will take control away from corporations. That's really what it's what it's about. And I think it's um it's it's good to take that that title because uh, or sort of take up that mantle because it is trying to do something similar. So it's useful to think about the two together. I think or to see the Green New Deal as a sort of taking that up. Yeah. Uh, so I think this is person is probably similar to many, you know. I mentioned to my parents, and they immediately started talking about how radical the idea of getting rid of all cars, planes, and cows was. But once I read it, I was super confused because, um, like, I was missing something. The Green New Deal said nothing in detail. Uh, I felt almost tricked. After watching the videos, I realized that the media and politicians have been overly tricking Americans into believing this solution is worse than our current situation. Well, that's a wonderful way of of expressing it there the um the idea that the solution is worse than the current situation and i think that's absolutely right what people are told which takes attention away from the current situation which is obviously very bad Uh, platforms only talk about the negative effects of the green new deal leaving passionate activists to sound like they are crazy Wow, what a wonderful, another wonderful comment, because people who, who are really, you know, behind the Green New Deal and are putting it forward, AOC would be an example, you know, is made to sound like she's totally crazy and this is this incredibly extreme uh, oddball thing. And because they are so outnumbered, the voice of reason is being trampled by climate deniers and those who are desperate to continue business as usual. As a nation, our job is to implement a change. Maybe if we take this first step, other countries will follow in our footsteps and we can save the planet. Yeah, no, I I think it's absolutely right. Um, But this person, you know, their experience is is just so um, spot on because I think, you know, many people you encounter, whether it's your parents or someone else, you know, have been convinced that this is just this radical thing. And, and, you know, anybody who would go along with this is just, you know, out there, an extremist, radical environmentalist, or just plain crazy. That is, you know, if you think about it, that that attitude is so prevalent the fossil fuel industry and the politicians that support it have been incredibly successful to, to do that, right? I mean, going back to what I said before about, you know, you know, milestone event in, in U.S. history when we passed, you know, the legislation that together forms the Green New Deal, what a milestone that was because it made people central, people's, you know, well-being central to, to what our, our country was about. And the Green New Deal would do so much for so many people as far as giving health care to people who don't have it, which is a broad, broad swath of Americans, providing education for everyone, people who couldn't afford it now for, because of various circumstances, you know, providing guaranteed, you know, income to people who don't have it, like, you know, homeless people. Um, this, is, this is absolutely, you know, um, positive. But how, how amazing it is that the American public thinks that it's just this radical, crazy thing. And that's not even addressing the central idea of it is this is going to address the climate crisis, what we've been working at all term. You know, what do we need to do to address the climate crisis? Yeah. We can all, you know, stop eating beef, but that's not going to be enough. And hey, we're not going to convince most Americans to stop eating beef just like that. We need something else. We need a bigger, you know, thing here. We need a plan. We need a we need a plan that can 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 do this. And we need politicians who are ready to, you know, enact it and think th- think it through. And that's what this is. And yet, this is craziness. This is being, you know, presented as this radical thing, and and, and very successfully. So that's. So yet another one of those frustrations, and many people um, talked about those frustrations in their their comments that, that we've been experiencing all term. But let me um, jump down here. Yep. Ah, uh, this person is currently in Texas, experiencing an energy crisis during an unexpected winter storm. Half of my city is without power, many without hot water, and now with the drinking water uh, boil notice. So 
don't drink your water unless you boil it first, but there's no electricity to boil your water. It's a problem. And uh, there was no policy put in place to protect our, um, our homeless neighbors. The government was aware of the issue this storm would bring before the public was aware of it. Yeah, so, well, this is an interesting um, event that's happening right now in Texas. And that, that's actually a very harsh way to put it. It's a horrible event. I mean, it's absolutely horrible. And the people there, are, many people are, are suffering and people have died. And it, it's very unfortunate. <sighs> On the what's, what's striking about it, if you followed the media coverage, well, it depends on what media you're following. So if you follow Fox News, and I do, for example, um, the, they've made much of the governor of uh, Texas blaming specifically the Green New Deal for this. Um, and that the idea is that the policies that are rolled into the Green New Deal, like renewable energy, is something that the governor has argued that Texas bought into with wind turbines. And according to him, wind turbines took down the grid in Texas. That is absolutely not true. If you go to any um, you know real media there, you will find that there's there's no truth to that. But it's an interesting um, example of how the Green New Deal is villainized, how mobilized politicians can be and move quickly in attacking it. So you know how in the world you know did did this you know, the Green New Deal become the villain here. And the problem when the Green New Deal has never been enacted and is not going to be enacted because, you know, the president we have isn't fully behind it. Um, and furthermore, the horrific irony here is that, you know, this is climate change at work. The you know, as we know, climate change is just not a, a, a warming globe. It can be, you know, weather patterns that are altered significantly in things like hurricanes and also things like patterns that would bring um, this sort of freezing cold in. So, you know, is climate change wholly responsible for this? Well, it's hard to say exactly, but certainly is a factor here. So this cold snap that came in is, is really partly climate change at work. So to, to spin this, that trying to solve climate change is what brought about this problem is just utterly fascinating. And yet for a broad swath of Americans, you know, this is yet another nail in the coffin of the Green New Deal and why we shouldn't do renewables and all. By the way, that, that's not the problem at all. Texas decided to go its own way on its own electric grid. It's not connected to the rest of the, the country or the states around it. So it, 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 it had a problem there. And there, there are a range of issues why the, the grid went down. Um, solar. I mean, wind is, is just a um, you know is is just being thrown up as this issue. It's not, but it does underscore you know how difficult this war of words will be to to win, because here's an example of the Green New Deal being you know attacked again and and solidifying you know, that a broad swath of people will just not go along with it because some people will remember and say, well, you know, the Green New Deal is what, you know, all those people died in Texas and how horrible it was was because of this crazy liberal idea. That it's just not the case, but it is a, it is a battle of words and it's, um, it's being played out every day right now. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah. By doing what the Green New Deal does or proposes, you know, spending a revol uh, revolutionizing infrastructure is possible to create millions, and this person is quoting from the Green New Deal, of good, high-wage jobs to provide security for all of us in the U.S. It is crucial that these jobs provide equal pay for everyone regardless of race, class, gender, citizenship, and physical aptitude. Moreover, the Green New Deal will give Americans the right to a living wage, welfare services, adequate and affordable housing, quality education, health care, all of which will help mitigate the fears that customarily accompany periods of significant change. These efforts will create healthy, sustainable, inclusive communities that are ready and willing to adapt to major policy reforms. Wow, another good, um, you know, so this is why I do the deep dives, because, you know, people say things better than I would. <laughs> um, this is absolutely right. So, 
Okay, let's break it down. First, here you hear again and again and again, we can't afford the Green New Deal. It's too expensive. It's going to cost trillions of dollars and all. How could we possibly afford it? And we, we addressed this back with uh, Project Drawdown when we saw that, yes, it will cost a billion dollars or more to, you know, put all the wind on, all the wind turbines in that we need in this country. And the trillion dollars is, is a lot of money, but we will save trillions and trillions of dollars in the long run. Similarly, there are going to be millions and millions of jobs lost. And if you just focus on that, you know, trillions, of, it's going to cost trillions of dollars and we're going to lose millions of jobs. You'll say, well, this, who would ever want this? Well, but we save trillions in the process and millions of jobs will be lost, like coal mining jobs, but millions of new jobs. And to quote, this person is quoting the Green New Deal, so this is a Green New Deal. Good high wage jobs to provide security for all of those in, in the U.S., that's the idea here. So, you know, someone's got to build all those wind turbines. Someone has to erect them. Someone has to do maintenance on them. Um, you may be in the air travel industry and, you know, well, is that is phasing out, but high speed rail is there. Someone is going to need to, to, to build that and to, you know, to, to run it on all. So, these, you know, jobs will happen, but new jobs will come along, but, but better jobs because with, you know, the way the Green New Deal is proposed here, um, that will, as this person knows, provide equal pay for everyone, regardless of race, class, gender, citizenship. So that, and, and it will be a living wage, right? And the very thing that, that's being debated right now. It is, again, such an interesting moment in history. You know, should we increase the minimum wage above, you know, $7.25 an hour? That, too, is being fought out as a battle of uh, words because people argue, well, that's going to cost millions of dollars if you do that. I mean, millions of jobs if you do that. Why? Well, because, you know, companies that, you know, won't be able to afford to pay their higher salary, they're going to have to go out of business. All those people are going to lose their jobs. That's the argument. That's what's being sold. But the fact is, you know, um, people in America need to make more money and some jobs will be lost, but then there will be other jobs. But that's why something like the Green New Deal is so important, because it puts into it puts in place a, a social you know safety net to hurt to help people who would be harmed. So let's say in the Green New Deal is enacted. You can imagine that, fantasize for a moment. And there's, um, you know, legislation to increase the cost of the minimum wage then. Well, the same argument could be made, well, jobs will be lost, you know, if it's going from like 15 to something new, like 25 or something. Well, yes, that's probably true, but everyone is guaranteed, you know, um, that they will continue to be paid by the government so that even if you're momentarily, you know, for a short period of time, lose your job, it's okay, you don't have to worry. You know, now the idea is, you know, you, you would have to worry. Yeah, go back to this comment again, um, down here. The Green New Deal will give Americans the right to a living wage, all sorts of social welfare services, adequate and affordable housing, quality education, and health care. So this is, again, you may say, well, this, sound, this is a fantasy. How could the government afford that? Um, other countries do that. They provide the citizens with those sorts of things. That's the argument here, that the government, as with the New Deal, will, you know, be strong. It'll take control, wrest control away from corporations. Instead of corporations making a ton of money, that money will go to people. And this, you know, that era that... Um, the era that the Green New Deal sort of, you know, came upon and changed um, was an era where, you know, there were robber barons, people that had enormous amount of um, power and wealth and aggregated it. And it's very similar. In fact, there's a, there's a very interesting documentary. It's, it's streaming on Netflix now. You can watch. It's, uh, it's called Capital in the 21st Century, uh, about how the era that we are living in now, where so much wealth is being aggregated by billionaires, people who own companies like Amazon. Um, and, you know, what the Green New Deal did, though, is to take control away and give it back to um, people. Yeah. So I think this is absolutely um, a great comment because it underscores, you know, so much can be can be gained here. So let's go down. 
Yeah, this person took a course on news, media, and democracy within the communication program, Go Communication Program. We learned how the media relies on sensationalism and is not fulfilling its responsibility to our democracy. Yeah, you know, you would expect media, news media, to do that, right? To, to you know, explain things. I mean, that's what media should do. So that why does that why is it important for democracy? Well, people need to know before they can, you know, act and choose politicians and everything. And the media should be informing us. But uh, no, unfortunately, consumers are attracted to the spectacle and don't want to be shown things they don't understand. So rather than the teaching voters about the details of policies and issues, the media dumbed down the message and relies on uh, partners, um, partisanship to tell voters how to feel about a policy. In this class, we discuss tactical framing by the media in great detail. It's a strategic move by the media to attract viewers and to make it more difficult for people to form educated opinion. Tactical framing doesn't care for the capacity um, capacity to solve the problem, only the political debate, the previously mentioned spectacle. So while the media, we would hope, would be summarizing relevant issues on behalf of its citizens so they can form opinions on their own. By the way, again, why, why do I have to even come to class? <laughs> I should just, you know, put all these in a list and give them to you because people are saying things better than, than I would. Yes, they should summarize relevant events on behalf of the citizens so they can form, you know, opinions on their own and, and act politically. Um, they often complicate the narrative and make voters more cynical about politics and its ability to get anything done. In this way, rather than educating voters, the media serves as a tool for polarization. Yeah, um, I will let you read the rest of that. Uh, but, uh, yeah. I, it's, it's again interesting, right? If this is a battle of words and you have, you know, combatants here like the fossil fuel industry and beef industry and all, um, it's also worth noting and thinking about the role that media has here because we have a free press and you would hope a free press would be able to cover this adequately. And yet that's not where we are now. What this person notes, the, the spectacle, these combatants here. Media in some ways when you watch shows and you see people sitting around a desk, you know, yelling and all, I mean, it's, it's like it's like reality TV. It's it, it it thrives on that sort of combativeness, the spectacle of it. Why people watch reality TV? Because you know it's p pitting people against each other, and that's what attracts viewers. And that's what the you know media has done. Is it's 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 you know played into that. And it's unfortunate because, as we've seen with, um, you know, the Vox um, little short documentary on tactical framing, it's, it has taken away all attention from the actual issue. You know, it has framed it as something else. It has done so tactically. And it has framed it as about, you know, communism or socialism rather than about everything that we've been talking about here. So I've been addressing the Green New Deal because you've read it and you, you know about it. And we can talk about things that it, you know, wants to do, like provide comprehensive health care for everyone. But... Most people don't know that, and it's the, the opening person noted, you know, they knew very little about the Green New Deal other than it was about the climate and it was radical. And then someone, of course, in the other comment noted that, you know, their, their parents just thought it was this radical, crazy idea. Why do we think that, though? Because it's not what this thing is about. This is not about hurting people. This is about helping people, helping everyone in America. Well, that's not our fault necessarily because media has, you know, the media that most people watch for news to become informed to make decisions is not is not doing its role anymore um, and and that's very unfortunate to think about because as this thing is being played out um, as a battle of words media is not helping things it's it's only making it worse but let me continue this person I, I added I brought another part in here so this was the third documentary or short film I had you watch, The Messenger in the Future with AOC. It made me feel slightly emotional. I loved how the story ended with people uniting to protect the environment and work toward a more equitable and sustainable future. However, it felt all too hopeful. As we've seen, Republicans and moderate Democrats have given strong pushback against the Green New Deal. So while it was temporary bliss watching AOC's vision, as soon as the video ended, I was struck by the reality that this will never be 
the reality. Yeah. Well, great point. I mean, certainly that's a very inspiring video. And uh, other people, we're going to talk about AOC in a minute with some other comments, um, certainly drew attention to that. Um, and it is AOC imagining the future, of course, and imagining what we did and or what we didn't do. But in her case, it's what we did. And I'm going to be a little spoiler for the end of the class because I'm going to tell you that on the final week, you're going to be asked to do a somewhat longer comment. So you're going to be doing one comment that week. Um, probably, yeah, I have, to, I have to work out the details with the TAs, but probably just one comment that week. But it is going to be... What I'm going to ask you to do is imagine yourself in the future the way AOC did. And specifically, I'm going to ask you to imagine yourself my age in the future, 60 years old, and what we did to, you know, correct this. So the course, again, is titled The Climate Crisis, What It Is, and What Each of Us Can Do About It. That project is The Climate Crisis, What It Is, and What We Did About It. And I want you to think about it in the future. And, and maybe you will be ultimately entirely you know, pessimistic that we didn't do anything and the world is just, you know, in a very bad state or that we began to take action now and what that was able to do. And that's what AOC does. But as this person rightly noted, there's such strong pushback here. And given this person's previous, the, the part of this person's comment that we just went over that, you know, um, there's so many things aligned against this to keep this from happening and fossil fuel interests and, and their politicians have, you know, portrayed this as just a radical, crazy communist idea. And, um, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, it, it's very, um, potent. You know, it would be difficult enough to do this. I mean, let's just say, you know, fantasize. Everyone, you know, in the U.S. or a great majority of people got behind the Green New Deal. We said, let's do this. It's still going to be incredibly difficult. You know, all this, you know, upheaval, the shifting around of jobs and all. I mean, it would, it, it would be very difficult. But the fact is, you know, it, we're going to be we're going to be fighting this the whole way, you know, and I'm sure that, you know, when, you know, if it was implemented, when all that upheaval was happening, they're going to be plenty of naysayers saying that this is the wrong thing. We've done it. And we have to stop and go back, you know. So it is frustrating. But I, I, I do think ultimately that, you know, that video is something to think about that, you know, it, it's not that we that, you know, we should do this and all but we have to do this in other words there's no option here it's not like we could say well you know life is okay now let's just stay with it the way it is even though this idea of this green new deal could make life better for everyone let's just stay with the status quo because it's not so bad well it is getting bad and is going to get worse for the planet so we have to do something and again you know here we have the first comprehensive plan ever proposed in the united states states and politicians who would who would bring it about if we if we you know um if we vote them in but okay let's jump down yeah um person uh, didn't realize you know um uh, uh, how little i actually knew about the green new deal and as someone who lives in a progressive area and thinks of myself as someone that stays up to date to current events, I can only imagine how uh, pervasive this lack of knowledge must be for people all around the U.S. On top of that, as the videos illustrate, there has been an active campaign to confuse and misdirect the public from the true facts surrounding the Green New Deal, just as we saw with Merchants of Doubt and Climate of Doubt a few weeks ago. Um, with all this being said, how is the average American supposed to make any sort of informed decision about whether this proposed plan is a good idea or not? Yet again, I found myself at my desk frustrated with the cyclical nature of the fight against climate change and how all the efforts being made seem to be going to waste. Then I watched AOC's video and found myself hopeful uh, for the future. It was um, such a refreshing message to follow the weeks of doom and gloom with what um, have gone through this quarter. I found myself truly believing that there was hope for the future. I'm just going to scroll through here. 
um, do read this, you know. Um, the Green New Deal seems to me to be an opportunity for us as a society to wipe the slate clean and to fix the injustices that we have institutionalized throughout our history. Uh, not just those involving the climate, but those involving social and economic injustices as well, with such an amazing opportunity presented to, uh, to us, it only seems foolish to turn our heads the other way. Wow. Yeah. I, um, again, wonderful statement. I mean, one way to think about this, and, and as this person rightly notes, you know, what this is, is to quote this person, such an amazing opportunity presented to us. So there are kind of two ways of looking at history, right? Um, or our place in it. And the whole MAGA thing um, with the Trump era, which is receding now, I think, and we'll see what happens if it comes back again. But the notion to make America great again, well, you know, many people would argue, um, myself included, this wasn't great at all. I mean, yeah, it was were things great for, you know, wealthy white men like Donald Trump in the 1960s and 50s? Sure, maybe, but for the rest of, you know, for everyone else, the majority of Americans, by the way, I mean, because, you know, you have to put women in there, you have to put people of color, you have to put people of all sorts of sexual, you know, identities and orientations. How is it great for them? But what this moment is, and as this person rightly latches on to, this is, I'm going to go back to the comment because this person says it better than I do. And, you know, an opportunity for us as a society to wipe the slate clean and to fix the injustices that we have been institutionalized throughout our history. Not just those involving climate, but those involving social and economic injustices as well. In other words, you know, here's a chance to adjust to do all that. We have all these social justice problems. They're huge in the United States. I mean, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, and a range of other issues, you know, are now, you know, f pushed in, 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 into the, you know, um, popular imagination in a way that they haven't really been before. I mean, we've dealt with issues like um, race in the United States from not just, you know, this moment in time, but civil rights movement and the whole issue of the Civil War and all. But, you know, here's our chance to to wipe the slate clean and imagine a new future. So in other words, let's stop thinking about trying to turn the clock back to another era, but let's turn around completely away from the past and toward the future and wipe the slate clean and say, let's build a new world. And that's what the Green New Deal is doing. We need to do this anyhow, because the climate is, is, is a problem that, that cannot get resolved unless we make profound cultural and social changes, which is what this course is about. But, you know, it's also an opportunity to fix all these other things. It's an opportunity, to give one example, so that every child in the United States could have the expectation to go to college to go further in, in, with that education if they want, to not have to, you know, do, you know, take on a huge financial debt in doing it, that everyone could do that, that this would be the land of opportunity, that we would opportunity for everyone, that regardless of, of who you were, you know, doesn't matter, you know, what your race is, what your sex is, none of it matters because everyone should have the same opportunities. That is not the case by any means in the United States now. You can't turn the clock back because it's never been the case, but we could make it in the future. And, and that's what is so encouraging about this idea is that it is a redrawing of the future um, in a way that is not just better for the planet, which is why we have to do it, but better for everyone here. Um, and I, I think, you know, the people in their comments who latched on that absolutely are, you know, are, are right. And, and the amazing thing about it, I think, about the Green New Deal is that for most of my life, this would have seemed kind of utopian, right? I mean, sure, all that is right, I, you know, but I would, you know, I would agree with all that throughout my life. But, um, well, from my teens on, I guess, um, um, I've. I say that because I, uh, my parents were very reactionary, conservative, and uh, took me, you know, I had to kind of develop into my own thinking as a teenager. But anyhow, um, 
that would have all been kind of like a pipe dream, but now we actually have politicians willing to implement this. There actually is viability to them. So someone like Bernie Sanders, yeah, he got the nomination for California. If it would have been up to Californians, Bernie Sanders would be our president. I mean, we would have made him the Democratic uh, um, candidate, and Californians overwhelmingly voted for the Democratic candidate. You know, ipso facto, President Bernie. But it didn't happen. But still, there's, a, there's, a, there's the possibility of it now in a way that there never was before. But the problem, the major problem is the one that we're talking about here is this communication issue that the American public just doesn't have any idea what this is all about. They think this is about radical ideas and taking away your burgers and your, your car rather than all the things that we're talking about that, that could be you know, brought about by this and, and the world that could be, that could be made by this. And, and that's what's so encouraging about AOC's little video because it, it, it you know, gives us a glimpse of what the world could be if we just got our act together and, and you know, rolled up our sleeves and, and set about to make it. So let's jump down. Ah, I love and admire AOC. Hey, don't we all? Um, she is the type of person that needs to spread awareness of this big issue of climate change because she has a common past she can relate to the working class and genuinely looks out for the best in others. I think we can learn a lot from like-minded people to enter Congress and initiate changes outlined in the Green New Deal. We need to take the privileged elites out of the government instead of elect those who understand our struggles and enact change to help us. All of us. Yeah. Um, AOC, you know, is so, I mean... If you ever wonder about how, you know, what a change one person could make, um, my other go-to example is always Chris Greta Thunberg, but AOC, I mean, it's amazing, right? AOC is, as this person notes, you know, not a privileged elite person. Her pedigree is not, you know, that she comes from some high, you know, um, profile law firm or something, and she, or, you know, it's not like that. AOC is is pretty much a regular person. The fact that she is a woman and a woman of color and um, is, is, is absolutely wonderful. And, and I would argue, because I've talked about generation here, the fact that she's, you know, from a generation that is going to experience all this. You know, AOC was the youngest woman ever elected to Congress, and she was in her 20s at the time. And, you know, it's kind of remarkable to think about. And I think this is why the example of AOC is so great, what, you know, anyone could do. I mean, AOC sort of took the, you know, the trajectory that we've talked about here with personal change and all that, but became an activist. What do you do if you're an activist? Well, find a politician to support. Bernie Sanders was her guy. Work on his campaign. Try to do what you could. And then why not just try to do this? Why not just, you know, put on your shoes and wear holes in them, walking around trying to get people to vote for you. And then when you get into power, which she did, um, then, you know, immediately introduce this Green New Deal. So it's pretty amazing. Um, if you like AOC, there's a documentary, if you happen to have Netflix, called Knock Down the House. Mm, I think it's like a year old now or so. But the filmmakers followed um, four hopefuls during the 2018 election who hoped to get into um, to Congress. And one of them happened to be AOC. So it's a very um, inspiring story if you, uh, if, you, if you have a chance to watch it. Uh, you can tell I'm big on documentary but knock down the house. Um, AOC's film and narration. I'm a huge fan of her, so I was immediately drawn to what she has to say. I'm also majoring in art and have always had a love of painting, so listening to her powerful language associated with a beautiful watercolor time lapse was quite beautiful to watch and see. Uh, I was left wondering after watching these films, who in their right mind could watch these and not agree with um, and support the Green New Deal? It baffles me, honestly. Yeah. Um, but I, I just wanted to focus on that as sort of a kind of a tangent, that comment. It's not really because, you know, this idea of communicating uh, something like this is central. And actually, we're going to have another comment or two, if I get time, if I have time to, to talk about the way that we can communicate in this new era. So we're in the, you know, the third decade of the 21st now. Things are different. It's not, you know, uh, broadcast medium. It's, it's not the only way we have to communicate. But this comment struck me because um, it was a very nicely done video, I thought. And I love the fact that it was just someone 
painting and then there you know there were no images you you saw aoc but you saw a painting of aoc and everything was done there it occurred to me that you know someone could have just made this in other words uh, this was actually made by a group of people um and aoc just you know narrated them all but i mean it was obviously a creative team to put all that together but i don't know that there would have had to be and it's provocative to think that anyone you know if 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 i guess where i'm going with this People often ask me, you know, what should you do? What should they they do if they want to make a difference in, with the climate crisis? What kind of careers they go into? Say you're an artist. You could have made this video. I mean, you know, all you have to do is pop up a phone um, camera or a phone right up above you and, you know, do the painting down here while people are watching. Um, you know, use the Adobe Suite, Premiere Pro or whatever to um, convert that into a video do a voiceover, and you could have made that. Um, it just strikes me as really interesting that if communication is the thing, and it is, there are ways of communicating this issue that are provocative and interesting. And I think one of the reasons, as this person rightly noted, that that was an effective video is because it was just so darn beautiful and so nicely done. And I, I thought it was intriguing that, again, it was it was just the work of an artist, basically. Of course, you know, you had you had to have a message to, to get out there. But um, it's intriguing to think that. And I guess we're, when I get to the other comment, I'll, I'll burrow into this a little more. But it's intriguing to think about that anybody now can communicate and uh, by way of new media things like you know youtube and TikTok and podcasts um so that you know you might think about that so this i guess I'm, I'm suggesting that you might think about doing something like this yourself if for example you're an artist yep yep um good to see young impactful politicians in congress who generally care about the environment and not their own agenda or money um aoc statement that we should commit to universal rights like health care and, and meaningful work for all resonated yeah so it is interesting to think about this notion um politicians who care not about their agenda or money that of course is the problem right that if you want to get reelected, you need to have um, incredible amounts of money nowadays because that's the way it works and the people willing to bankroll you are like large corporations and then you know you have a, a um, sort of a debt to pay or you know you could break free and decide not to 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 act in the um, benefit of fossil fuel industry if they financed you, but then they wouldn't give you money next time around. So someone like AOC, the way her campaign is done, and Bernie Sanders is the best example of this, and I think I may have mentioned it before, Bernie Sanders didn't take any money from large corporations at all. It was just all crowdfunded by people sending in, you know, $20 here and there. Um, and AOC is, of course, and actually in that little video suggested that, you know, central to all this is campaign reform so that we can have politicians in there like AOC who aren't interested in, you know, corporate funding, but are interested in, you know, um, her constituents, the people who she's there to represent, because that's what it is. It's the House of Representatives. It's those, you know, people who are representing um, us. Yeah. So uh, great point. Um, Take action will cause pain. Uh, really sums up the Green New Deal. I really enjoyed the videos this week for the reason that they took something that so many people talk about, but so few people truly understand and put in terms that the general public comprehend. So again, that's just another little underscore. Those those two Vox videos, and I could have given you a, a number of different ones, but I, I thought they were very useful because they did such a good job of communicating. I'm glad this person agreed. Um, plus their video shows how small changes Angels will not suffice and that the reversal of climate crisis will not be an easy feat. It, it is not going to be small things. It has to be big. There will be lost jobs and panic, but there are solutions. The Green New Deal proposes jobs for those who will lose them due to the um, halt of the fossil fuel use. It also suggests affordable housing, high quality free health care. The Green New Deal recognizes that the citizens with the greatest barriers to overcome will be the ones... Um, 
who will suffer the most from the changes proposed in the Green New Deal. This recognition led to the protection of all lower class um, and income families in the Green New Deal. It won't just protect the coal miners and fossil fuel industry worker. It will protect all those who are losing essential essentials for living in the effort to halt climate crisis. Um, yeah, th- what a wonderful statement again. Um, and the issue, the whole issue of like, the people who are going to suffer most on a planetary level are people who have done very little. I keep mentioning the 3 billion people that only put 5% of greenhouse gases up there. Um, but people in the United States are going to suffer too. And these are not, you know, the people who have huge, you know, stock port, uh, portfolios and, and all that. But these are people who, who don't have a lot to begin with. And that's why these protections have to be put in place. That's what the original New Deal was about. You know, Americans were hurting, you know, millions were unemployed during the Great Depression. How were those people going to be taken care of? The, the notion that FDR was so behind was that the government has to take that job. The government is about us. It's about protecting us when things are going well and things aren't going well. And and that's that's the idea behind it. Um, and this person rightly knows uh, this will lead to the protection of all lower class and income families. It, it has to. It has to protect everyone. And it's, it's interesting to think about because, you know, the Green New Deal is, you know, people who rail against it say it's going to hurt us, hurt people, hurt people. But but at core, it's about protecting people. That That's what it's about. And it's about giving people better lives, not taking away. And, you know, this whole tactical framing has been very good at suggesting that it's going to take away, take away, take away. But it's not. It's about protecting and giving and improving. So, Okay. Yeah, when I was much younger, I read two books that uh, take a deep look at the infrastructure um, that deliver bananas and tomatoes. The one was Tomato Land. Um, yeah, um, these two pieces shine a light on um, people um, think uh, who pick these plants, the places they are produced and how things come about. Younger me was inspired in a way. I wanted to be a food scientist, someone who could work to create uh, better foods and influence the way the consumption was expressed in the U.S. I wanted to be a person who changed the horrible conditions brought about by the corporations who produce food. As time went on, I became more cynical and realized how lofty those ambitions were, and I lost the spark that inspired me to pine for a better world. All that being said, AOC is working to reignite that flame. Through her actions and words, we are beginning to see a seismic shift in the very foundation of our society that our society rests on. She is encouraging young people all around the country to be the change that they want to see in the world, echoing a phrase often attributed to Gandhi there, be the change that you want to see in the world. Uh, These tangible steps are awesome to see, and I hope that she continues to gain seniority so that we can see the movement that she helped blossom into a full-fledged revolution. Yeah, um, she will continue to gain influence and seniority. Um, Let's hope. Um, Gee, let's see. How old will she be at the next election? Uh, She would be 35 when she would be. um, She would be 35 years old at the time of what could be her inauguration if she decided to, I don't know, run for president, um, taking over as the youngest president in in U.S. history. Who knows? This person is right. Um, but also, I wouldn't be discouraged. So this person um, noted the um, the book Tomato Land um, started off, which is by Barry um, Esterbrook. Um, so what that was about, it's a great book, actually, uh, 2011. Um, and it's about the tomato industry in Florida. And it's about the people who work there, the workers, field workers there, and the conditions under which they were working, absolutely horrible. So Estabrook takes us inside of that industry. And it's one of those incredibly depressing things because, as Estabrook rightly notes, if you look at the definition of what constitutes slavery, yeah, that was pretty much slavery, um, those conditions, um, in that, you know, people were working for, for you know, um, 
These are people who are undocumented, so are not working for minimum wage. And they're working for less than that, and yet they had to give what money they had back to the people they were working for, for housing and for food and everything. So they were getting like nothing. It was like slavery. But um, that was an actually an encouraging end of that story, because um, if you if you catch up with Estabrook more recently, and he's done a few podcasts in the last few years. And I think he did one, uh, NPR's Fresh Air with Terry Gross, but I could be wrong. But anyhow, he's done them. And that industry, because of that book, in part, has has improved very much because it was a scandal. People it drew attention to this problem and people set about resolving it. And is it resolved? Totally no, but it's it's a lot better than it was. So I, I mentioned this as a, to be a little heartening to this person because, you know, you could get demoralized and all. And yet that guy made a difference. And AOC is, is an even better example because, you know, how big her difference is. She is absolutely making a difference. So for all the people who think that, you know, <clears throat> What can I do? What can one person do? I'm not, you know, you know, um, anyone's out of the ordinary or something. Well, you know, AOC was seemingly, you know, from the outside, a pretty ordinary person. And I think I would argue that what makes AOC AOC is, I mean, I don't want to d diminish her and I don't want to say she's not bright or that she's not, you know, well-versed and dedicated and all, but her tenacity is the thing that, you know, if I were to, like if someone said, you know, one word, AOC, tenacity, she has, she has to have all that. I mean, she's obviously very knowledgeable about this and, and cares and all, but I mean, she just, she's, she's sort of like a little force of nature here, right? I mean, in, in like, a, like a whirlwind and a single person and, and, and she just doesn't seem stoppable. And I think I would say the same about someone like Greta Thunberg. And it just, you know, it pulls all this back to personal action again and activism because one person can have huge role to play, even if it is bringing about collective action, something like the Green New Deal. Um, yeah. Um, this was a comment here I wanted to actually talk about. Um, the model of the Vox videos and the message from the video, uh, future video, is a great example of new way of informing people. Some of the most informative pieces of media I've seen are on YouTube and not even ones produced by big production companies such as Vox. I've seen videos done by a single person working out of their bedroom that are very well thought out, often heavily researched and present great analysis of social justice and political topics, such as Big um, Joel's videos on Prager View. Well, Prager U. Um, Stop for a moment. I, I was not aware of Big Joel before this, but I watched that particular video, which is, I think, 30 minutes long or so, a lo which is long by YouTube standards for sure, um, on PragerU and sort of the celebration of the billionaire class and, and basically of robber barons um, from, you know, the turn of the last century, the 19th to 20th. And um, it was absolutely terrific. Um, and I have to say, the, one of the reasons I put my videos up, the one you're watching I put up, not that I expect to have some great following, but it, it just struck me that this material, as much as it, it can be, should be out there. And like Big Joel's videos, as I looked through, um, you know, all the offering had there are great. And one of the things that inspired me, and again, I didn't know about Big Joel, but um, ContraPoints, I don't know if people follow ContraPoints. Um, I just happened to, I forget, I think I heard her on a podcast and then I researched it and since I looked at her YouTube channel and I was particularly struck by two that dealt with um, free market capitalism, basically with capitalism itself. And I realized they were like 20 minutes long, but together they were a 40 minute lecture and a really good one. And to go back to this person's point in the comment, yeah, anyone now can take on the role of communicator. And this was the one I was sort of talking about before. If you're a painter, you can imagine how you could have made that, you know, message from the future yourself. But um, that particular, you know, uh, uh, video um, with Big Joel is him. Basically, I think he's like sitting on a sofa just talking to you, kind of like what I'm doing. Um, and yet he's very good at it in a way that I'm not. And um, but it's very effective and it 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 makes you realize that communication is so central and that that anyone can do it nowadays um you know and that and uh, actually let me jump back to the comment because i won't read the whole comment here 
Um, if we want to mobilize people, the old ways of media and news are just not cutting it. You know, there's so many new avenues of getting information, I think, more accessible in older forms of media. This is such a good comment, and I'm going to end on this as I see I've gone as long as I should. But I think it's something to, to think about, you know, if um, – I'm not saying you have to, to become a uh, work on becoming an influencer. Although I should note that a, um, a student of mine last year in this class, right? Yeah, last year in this class, English 23, sometimes hard to, to keep them straight. Um, but noted that um, came to me and said, you know, I, my sister has a YouTube channel and she's been working on it for like four or five years. And, and she dressed and it's about environmental issues. And he told me that initially, you know, like everything else, she just started small started small and I think last I checked she had I mean, it was over half a million subscribers but I think it might be up to 700,000 now and this is just a person wanting to communicate working out of her house the same way that Big Joel is, the same way that Natalie does in ContraPoints and it's rather remarkable um, so I, I teach a course um, inspired by this. Um, I taught a course in the fall, this fall, um, which the, the whole goal of the, the class was, the whole assignment, was that everybody had to produce their own communicate, way of communicating about the climate crisis, any way they want, uh, um, anything about the climate crisis that they wanted in any way that they wanted to. Um, well, not totally anyway. You had um, three ways that could go about it. You could either produce a YouTube video, which was probably the most popular. And I think number two was a series of TikTok videos, because I am convinced that, that you, can con you can convey a lot of information in a TikTok video. There's a lot of silliness on TikTok and YouTube, but there is the potential for real communication there. Um, there was a third option. You could, you could script a podcast episode. But I've known over the years a number of students who have started their own YouTube channels, their own TikTok channels, and their own podcasts, in fact, audio podcasts. Just something to think about. I'm not saying, you know, everybody has to do this, but I think the example of AOC, and I'll, I'll end on her example rather than the Green New Deal itself, is, is just so inspiring because it's clear that, that you know, I think anybody can, and I'm not. I'm not saying that you know that that AOC doesn't have a special, you know, group of talent. She really does. But I mean, yeah, I think I think anyone. I think anyone certainly in this class could could make a difference. And you might say, well, how would you even go about it? Um, and I think in another era, it would have been a, a real challenge and all. But here, people can begin right now, which is so so absolutely cool about this and i think people like big joel i have to watch more of his videos now um or a great example of how to to do that i mean you have to think about this he's obviously very carefully researched these things but you know production values aren't really great nor is there um uh, you know, a lot of uh, technical things that he does you know there's some effects and all but not a whole lot so okay that's it. So the Green New Deal, now you know what it is. Um, if you're wondering, you know, how we can collectively do something. I didn't talk about in this um, little deep dive today, but about the idea, of, which I won't bother to go through again, the idea of the Marshall Plan for the Earth, which is this other notion. And it's important to note that the Green New Deal is, is, is great, but it focuses just on the U.S. We really need to think globally as well. So if people are afraid that, you know, if the Green New Deal is too radical now, imagine if we've rolled into the idea that we also have to help the rest of the planet, the other countries, other people. Um, I think that would be even more so. But as a number of people noted, you know, the, the Green New Deal was a step in the right direction. Direction. Even though it didn't get implemented yet, it still influenced a lot. And I would argue that the Biden, you know, climate plan um, owes much to it. And 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 why I would argue that, you know, Joe Biden, this is not the first time that he ran for president. And if you look at all the, the other times or if you look at his, you know, he has a very definite track record of how he's voted and the kind of things he's been backing and all. If you look at his history, climate hasn't been a big deal. That's to his credit that he realized now it absolutely has to. But but clearly 
you know, you know, in helping him formulate that was the Green New Deal. So it's it's absolutely important, it, and um, I mean, it's not you know, some people got depressed here; it didn't actually happen, but but it but it did make a profound influence, and and maybe we'll we'll make an even more profound influence as time goes on. Okay, that's it for today, and uh, I'll see you next time. Take care.